speak up louder. My name is Yupa Stein, and I'm volunteer co-chair for the Families for Living Climate Plastics Working Group, which is an affiliate of the National Organization Beyond Plastics. And Families for Living Climate is a statewide organization based here in Missoula. And Sarah, who is the communication, everybody see Sarah? She's the communications director at Families for Livable Climate and has a lot of information and a sign-up sheet back there, so make sure to check that out. I'm going to check my notes because I uh, don't want to forget anything. So Liz, I'm a speech for where are you, Liz? There's Liz, she's my fellow co-chair of the Plastics Working Group. That's the Liz. Uh, so thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, I hope you help yourself to some snacks and drinks, and feel free to get up and refill as needed. We'll keep this kind of informal and flowy. Any, anyone got that? Oh, excellent. Um, Want to thank uh, little Linda Wigglesey for preparing this beautiful food. Raise your hand. <laughs> I also uh, want to thank Joe Greathouse for making cookies. Where are you, Joe? Oh, she, she went home. Well, thank you, Joe. <laughs> and Beth Harris, who's not here today, tonight, but she made these lovely flowers. So I want to thank Beth. And I want to thank the Public Library for sharing this amazing space. Uh, this presentation is being recorded by MCAT, Missoula Community Access Television. Dylan's in the back there. Thanks, Dylan. And um, it's through a media assistance grant that was given to families for local climate, so thank you for that. And it will be aired on MCAT channel 189 and downloaded to MCAT's video on demand or YouTube channel. So there'll be opportunities for we'll sharing the recording link at another time. A quick overview of uh, our time together. I'll be doing just a little more housekeeping and then I'll be doing several thank yous because we have a lot of people still to thank and then we'll have a couple speakers and at about 7.15 we will conclude the, the speaker's time so if you can hold your questions until then we'll have about 15 minutes. We need to then be cleaned up and out of here by the time the library closes at 8 so to respond out of respect to the library, we'll, we'll be kind of moving things along after that point. Um, let's see. So, we want to take a moment to, to be grateful for this land, water, air, and soil, and the biodiversity of life that makes our lives possible. We, this area we call Montana, has a long history. This map usually shows the lands that were stolen from indigenous people during colonization. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge the Assiniboine, Blackfeet, Chippewa Cree, Crow, Grovat, Kootenai, Little Shell, Northern Cheyenne, Plains Creek, Ponderay, Salish, Sioux, Hidatsa, Mandan, Arikara, and other indigenous nations of this region, past, present, and future. Families for a Livable Climate acknowledges that indigenous people are on the front lines of the climate crisis and are and will be disproportionately affected by climate impacts. They're also at the forefront of leadership and speaking up about protecting Earth for generations. To honor and support the work, Families for Livable Climate suggest donations to organizations such as Western Native Voice and Indigenous Environmental Network. I want to thank Providence and St. Patrick Hospital for sponsoring this event. And Sarah Johnson is here in the back. She's the Pro Sustainability Program Manager. And they have some displays about some of the amazing work that they've been doing. They were recently recognized as one of the top 25 hospitals in the nation for pursuing environmental excellence. And one, one of the quote from this, uh, this press is, and this is Sarah, 
we were able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 10.2% from our, our baseline year in 2019. So thank you for your leadership. some other folks to thank and there are several actions both at city levels here in Missoula and Bozeman and Billings and Mike and Isaac are going to talk about that when they when they talk about um, but I'm just going to thank some people no they'll, they'll fill in some details so city council members who voted to reduce plastic pollution action in Missoula this year. And if any of you are here, please stand up when I read your name. Heidi West, Jennifer Savage, Martha Becerra, is that right, Jenny? I your uh, uh, Sierra Farmer, Gwen Jones. <laughs> Gwen, Gwen Jones, yay, thank you, Gwen. Um, oops, got ahead of myself. Um, Daniel. Carlino, Amber, are you here? Uh, Amber Sherrell, Mike Nugent, Stacey Anderson, and Kirsten Jordan. And also, Gunnar Jordan has was supported. And there were many people, some of you in this room, who came to City Hall, who testified, and who wrote to your council members. So please stand up, if any of you are here. I see some of you. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. And Mike and Isaac will fill you in on those. But these are representatives who voted for those bills. They didn't make it out of committee. We have Bob Carter, Representative Bob Carter from the Toplands in Missoula. We have Representative John, Jonathan Carlin, who's here. Yay, Jonathan! Uh, Representative Marler, who also introduced the bill. Uh, Katie Sullivan and Mark Fay. And they're also. Uh, uh, representatives from other uh, towns who voted yes. So thank you. Thank you, all of you. And any of you who testified, who wrote letters, who spoke up and had your voice shared for legislative action, can you stand up? Thank you, thank you. Okay. All righty. And these are organizations who spoke up on legislative action. Montana Conservation Voters, MEIC, we have at least one person, Matthew, are you here? Yes, Matthew. You have that. Citizens for a Better Flathead, Montana League of Cities and Towns, Forward Montana, Eco Montana, Montana Audubon, Sustainability, Galaxy Valley Beyond Plastic, Cottonwood Environmental Law Center, and Families for Little Climate Plastic. So the next time we do this for the next legislative session, we'll have pages filled with us. So this is a really good start, so thank you. Uh, now I'm going to introduce one of our keynote speakers, Megan Wolf. Megan is a, oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Still shouting. Megan is a public health historian with an eye using history to inform policy. After receiving her master's and doctorate in public health from Columbia University, she spent over a decade at Wild Cornell Medical College, where she developed a mental health policy initiative within the Department of Psychiatry. She believes that climate change is the greatest threat to health and well-being in contemporary life, and that overproduction of plastics touches on every phase of the climate fight. She lives with her family in New Paltz, New York, and she's here visiting. Her folks live in Bozeman, so she gets to come to Montana every summer. And yeah, you can go ahead and sort of load up. Um, um, she was part of the Mindu Monaco Commission on Plastics and Human Health. So it was a global commission looking at all the research we have to date of the impacts of uh, plastics on human health. 
and give a big round of applause to Megan. Just a sec, we have technical. Have a bite, it fits out of the way here. That would be good. Hold it. That's a little weird. <laughs> Is that? Okay. Sibilance. Sibilance. <laughs> uh, time by me. Is that? Okay. The sound is good. All right. Take it away. There we go. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's always a delight to come out to Montana. I'm here for about a month every year, and it, it's one of the best months of the year, but I don't usually get very far out of Bozeman, so this has been a nice excuse to check out the area. Uh, so I am with a group called Beyond Plastics, and our mission is to end plastic pollution everywhere, which we actually think is quite feasible. It's, you know, it, it elicits some laughter, some places. Um, but as I'm going to talk about, this is actually a fairly short-term problem. Although it's an overwhelming one, it's one whose origins we can see and whose end we can project. We can get there. Uh, I'm going to say this off the top. I'm not enough of a masochist to work in an industry or in a field where there is no hope. I see a lot of hope here. So this presentation can be kind of dark. Uh, there are a couple of schools of thought about talking about climate change. One is that if you talk about it too much and you say too much, then people get discouraged and they tune out. Uh, and the other one is that people should know. They should know everything. Um, and I'm in the latter school, which makes me a bummer parade, but <laughs> you'll leave her knowing a lot more than you did before, and it's probably going to color your outlook on it and your decisions on what you're going to do going forward, and that's a good thing. So as you mentioned, I'm a historian by trade. And uh, one of the things you learn as you're studying history is that it's really not inevitable at all. Actually, anybody could have um, predicted the Spanish Inquisition. They, it, was, it was coming. You could see it uh, because it was coming from human action. Human action makes history. There are individual players that create, that make decisions, and those decisions have impacts, and those impacts rolled out. So problems that are not inevitable are solvable. And this is my outlook, and really the outlook at Beyond Plastics, of how we're going to tackle this one. So what is the problem? Well, right now, there are about 10 billion tons of plastic that have been produced since 1950. And you can see it all around you. Some of it might be on your table, but we worked pretty hard to create a plastic-free event. Um, you know, if we were standing on terra firma ground, you'd probably see it just all over the ground. You see it blowing around. It's everywhere. There are not very many plastic pollution deniers. Now, a lot of that plastics are, are really very new. Um, this is a curve of the plastic production since 1950. And actually, as a historian, what I find interesting about this curve is what happens here a little bit after 2000. It ticks up in a way that it hadn't before. It's a, it's a hockey stick curve. Um, there were decisions that were made around this time. Um, but also, because of those decisions and the new arc of this, this curve, about half of the plastic that exists in the world today was created in the last 15 years. So that is really recent. If you think back to where you were 15 years ago, um, you know, think about the role of plastic in your life. Um, the plastics manufacturers would have you think that you were walking around in a wasteland crying out for the next new convenience, that you know, the thing that you needed most in your life was more plastic. But probably that wasn't the case. And keep that in mind. Um, as you go forward and you hear rhetoric about, well, we can't reduce plastics because we need this, we need that convenience, we can imagine our way out of this crisis pretty easily because most of us lived before it, it started. Well, when did it, oh yeah, and uh, by the way, this cat is about 15 years old, so that puts it also into perspective. Like, that, this is the age of the plastics crisis, is this cat, so we can move past this. Okay, so. Uh, you think about, well, so how did this become a crisis? Well, we're going to talk a little bit of, about materials, basically. What is plastic and why is it so durable? Why is it hanging around so much? It's an adage in history that the invention of the ship was the invention of shipwreck. And that's really true of plastic. With plastic, we have a material that at its inception was 
miracle. It was it was malleable. The word plastic means to to form, to bend, to shape. It was very inexpensive to produce. It could be turned to almost any use, and it was extraordinarily durable. It would last and last and last, which those are fantastic qualities. But if you have them, you should probably use them judiciously, and that's not what we've done. So we got our shipwreck out of our ship. So where did the ship set sail? Well, plastics themselves go to get back to the end of the 19, 1900s. The original plastics were, were created, <laughs> they were created to, to help to um, um, supplant scarce materials like ivory. So billiard balls were made out of ivory. Plastics were innovated that would help to replicate what a billiard ball was. The problem was, because they are carbon-based and they're coming from carbon fuels, they tended to be kind of explosive. So if you have a couple of billiard balls that hit together very quickly, they're going to explode. So it didn't have a really great profile as a material, and it was used only very sparingly for things like combs and stuff like that, that you know are moving away from bone and from shell into plastics until World War II comes along. And then we have a need for materials in a really big way. So better than looking through chemistry, um, people hit the benches, and they came up with some amazing innovations that really did help the, uh, the, the Allies win World War II. Nylon comes in to replace uh, silk and parachutes. Plexiglass is an amazing material for aviators, for all kinds of people who are going to be having to deal with incoming projectiles. People ask about this particular uh, one. This, uh, uh, this airplane, sorry, is a American airplane, and the, uh, <laughs> the swastikas were the number of uh, Germans that they had shot down. Um, but also polyethylene and polyvinyl fluoride, polyvinyl fluoride yeah, give you um, uh, water resistance in ways that you never used to have before. So where you would have had to have an oil skin to protect you from the rain, now you have what we consider modern rain, rain gear. So this was a huge series of innovations, and the manufacturers knew right off the top that there were going to be huge numbers of household applications, and that they would want to continue the market after the war. So even during the war, these little mom and pops that had created these kinds of plastics, like Monsanto and Dow, started looking for new markets. And they actually became some of the biggest um, accounts on Madison Avenue as early as the mid-1940s, looking for ways to push plastics into the house. Now, they actually encountered a fair bit of resistance. I don't know who remembered the exploding billiard balls, but many people who handled plastics this early in their history found that they were flimsy, they didn't seem to, they didn't seem valuable, they didn't seem like they were really as durable as they were claimed. So the, uh, the industry did a lot of advertising, and they managed to basically make lemonade out of lemons by marketing things as disposable because they were flimsy, they felt light. So the idea here was to grow the market not by moving plastic into people's homes, but through them. You can throw it away, you can buy it again. And this is the very beginning of our disposable culture as we know it today. So this is going to grow and grow and grow, and it did not grow by itself. It grew with millions of dollars of advertising, and it has continued to grow in the same way. But we're looking at the origin here of the problem. Those of us who were born after World War II, which is probably most of us at this point, don't even notice plastic. It's just out there, we're like fish in the water going, what's water? Uh, there's an old joke about an up, uh, fish going upstream and fish going downstream, and they meet in the middle, and one says, hey, you know, how's the water? And the other one says, what's water? That's kind of where we are with plastics. You barely even notice it until you start thinking hard. So what is all this plastic being used for? I know that uh, the writing on this slide is a little small, but this top one is packaging. 42% of all the plastic under production right now is going to packaging. Building and construction is another sector where, even actually, there are useful uses for plastic. Of course there are. There are necessary plastics. Medical plastics often fall in that category. Building and construction, yes. But packaging, mm, I don't know. And textiles are another interesting one. Those of you who wash labels pretty carefully will have noticed that it's getting very difficult to find cotton uh, and wool or linen on the market, that most textiles now are at least synthetic mixes. Uh, and that's coming from carbon fossil fuels. So that's where it's coming from. Where is it all going? This is another of those slides that kind of 
it gets deeper the longer you look at it. We wish that we were recycling plastic. We've been told that we can be recycling plastic, but we were told that by industry, which in 1988 slapped the chasing arrow signs onto all of the resin codes and fooled us into thinking it was all recyclable. Only a tiny fraction of it is. So between five and 6% of plastics in the United States are recycled. Most of them, the vast majority, are going into landfill. Incinerated plastics are waste to energy. Incinerators love plastic because they're made out of fossil carbon, so they're going to help offset the wet garbage by burning brighter. Mismanaged plastics is a euphemism for litter, and ocean plastics, this tiny, tiny little line, is the one that started to come to our attention maybe 15 or so years ago, as we started noticing greater quantities of plastic washing up on beaches, we started seeing videos of birds and fish that had ingested plastics, and many of you probably saw the viral video of the sea turtle that had gotten a plastic straw up its nose. That's gotten people's attention. Um, and it's brought a lot of attention to this issue, but it turned out to be the very beginning of the issue. But we'll take a look at it because it's informative. Currently, between 8, to 8 and 15 million tons of plastics enter our oceans every year, which is the equivalent of a garbage truck a minute backing up to an ocean and dumping its load. At this rate, by 2025, which is just around the corner, for every three pounds of fish, there'll be a pound of plastics in the ocean. And at current projection, if we go up to 2050, it's going to be a ratio of one to one. So we have turned our oceans into watery landfills. What's happening there? Well, the first thing that's happening is what we first saw, which is ingestion. Um, up here on the, well, this is my left, yeah, your left. This albatross is feeding plastic to its chicks. Albatross see plastic floating in the water, and if it's orange or blue, it looks like shrimp. They'll pick it up and they'll take it back to the nest. This fish here has been eating what are called nurdles, which are the very first thing that they manufacture when they're making plastic, are little pellets, and they're melted into anything, from a Barbie dream house to a water bottle, you name it, it's nurdles, but they look just like fish eggs. And when they spill, which they do very regularly, they, uh, they get a biofilm on them, like bacteria and other things congeal on them, and so they smell to fish just like food. Uh, so the fish are going after them, and that's also the case of plastic bags, which look like jellyfish to anything that eats a jellyfish. So we're seeing a lot of animals that have ingested these, and that doesn't ever go well for the animals. Sometimes it's a blockage, sometimes it's a perforation. Oftentimes, as in the case of this albatross, it actually just fills their stomachs to the point that they can't eat anymore. They have a sense of satiety, but they die of starvation. 99% of seabirds are affected by plastics in this way. But we're also noticing that this is a land issue. Um, basically, it kind of reminds me a little bit of human evolution itself, where it started in the ocean and it's coming out on land. As we're looking around on land, we're seeing more and more of the same things happen. So in areas where you have ruminants, and this is the first notifications of this really are coming out of India, Africa, places where you have ruminants that are wandering around in highly populated areas, they're getting into the garbage, and they're eating the garbage. Most of the studies that we have about the impact on ruminants are from those areas, but a couple of them are starting to come out of Europe. And the European studies are showing the same thing, that about 30% of animals that graze have plastics in their stomachs. Um, this is a what came out of uh, the stomach of a, uh, I think it was a dairy cow. Um, so it was just full of plastics. Uh, and, you know, we've been seeing this in whales for quite some time. These are microplastics. This is the next stage. Um, now what happens with microplastics, so we, we have this durable material. It's not going to break down in the environment. It can't. It, the carbon-carbon bonds that make plastic plastic will not break. But it'll just break up into littler and littler pieces. Now, I'm just curious, who in this room has heard the term microplastic before? Yeah, just about 100%. As recently as a year and a half ago, if I pulled the room, it would have been just a few people here and there. But the cognizance of microplastics is rocking forward because they're scary, because they're everywhere. It's a real aha moment. As a medical historian, it kind of reminds me of what happened when people were able to see germs under the microscope for the first time the 1870s and the 1880s. By 1900, everybody's washing their hands. If you couldn't see it, you didn't know about it, it didn't bother you, but we're starting to see these microplastics. They'll turn up in the ocean, 
Uh, they'll turn up in fresh water. They'll turn up just about everywhere we've ever looked for them. Um, these little guys, D, are the ones that people are becoming, and by people I mean investigators and scientists, the most concerned about because they're microfibers. They're coming off of our clothes. They come off when we're wearing with our clothes. They come off when they're washed. And because they're little long fibers, they have the capacity to pick up wind even more easily than the tinier particles do. And so they float around. They're in the dust. They're in the drinking water. Uh, and they're even, oh, sorry, skip. Sorry. They're even, I'm going to show you a photo of a snowflake with one on the snowflake. Um, but they're, I mean, they're really powerful. Um, the place that we first started thinking about microplastics and what was happening, again, was the ocean. Thinking about all this plastic that goes into the ocean, what's not ingested gets broken up by the waves and the sun. It gets brittle, and it breaks down and down and down. So the largest of microplastics would be a, an object that would be about the size of a pencil eraser. And the smallest are known as nanoplastics and are smaller than human blood cell and are in the human bloodstream. Um, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. We don't have an endpoint. It's like an infinity measure on plastics. They never stop being plastic. So being that small, they're very readily incorporated into the hydrologic cycle. So if you have plastics in the water, they're going to evaporate into the air, and they get up into the condensation in the clouds, and they come back down as precipitation. And it's because of that that we're able to find plastics literally everywhere on Earth. Um, some of the first studies finding just how pervasive these were were done in Utah in the desert. Tons of microplastics in the deserts. Uh, a lot of it was just flowing, but some of it is coming down in rainfall periodically. Um, we found uh, microplastics at the base of the Marianas Trench, up to the top of the highest peaks. It's in all the water supplies. Uh, here it is on a snowflake. So it can hitch a ride on a snowflake, it'll hitch a ride in the wind, it'll hitch a ride in the, uh, in the rain. And this is microplastics um, going up the vasculature of a wheat plant. So if it's in the air and the water, it's getting into the ground, it's getting into the soil, it's getting into the plants. We don't know a lot yet. This is a new frontier about what's happening, but we do know that the crop yields go down as you find more microplastics in the soil. We also know that creatures in the soil do not benefit from microplastics, much like um, uh, seabirds. Uh, you know, they well, we don't know a lot about intestinal perforations for earthworms, but they fail to thrive. There was a new term that was coined this year called plasticosis, that's said to affect sea, well, seabirds and any birds that are eating uh, eating plastics, which is that they reproduce at a reduced rate, they are more susceptible to disease, and they grow less. So we're seeing that even in earthworms. Um, let's see. Yeah, they can stunt the growth of earthworms. They cause earthworms to lose weight. Uh, oh, and hit effects do include obstruction and ir irritation of the digestive tract, limiting of the absorption of nutrients and reducing growth. So what's happening in the larger animals is happening in the smaller animals too. This is an insect in Adirondack State Park that was identified in January of this past year. And what's interesting about this to me is that Adirondack State Park in New York doesn't have any plastics manufacturing facilities. It doesn't have any landfills. It doesn't have any recycling centers. In order for this many microplastics to have arrived in a place that untouched, they had to come in through the hydrologic cycle. This is Flathead Lake, where I'm going to get to go tomorrow. I have not been there. But me. With my daughter. Um, many of you may remember last summer a, uh, an article came out. There was a study that was released of uh, microplastics in Flathead Lake. They found them. Not too surprising, they found them. And they found about the same uh, rate of microplastics as they did in other lakes that are close to populated areas. So that was a big surprise considering how remote Flathead Lake is. It's thought that much of it, if it's not coming in on rain, is coming in from the, uh, the headwaters um, and coming in from leachate from garbage dumps. So as plastics are breaking down in the garbage dumps, they're getting into any of the waters that are flowing. A couple of interesting um, comments by the investigators on this study. Um, gosh, let's see. Yeah, the chief investigator said, I think people think plastic pollution is more serious in the ocean, but many people live inland and we need for fresh water. It may affect our daily life more directly than plastic in the ocean. So we're hitting a pivot point now where we're getting to realize that on land, it's actually as much as a problem as at sea. We're just beginning to recognize it. 
This study, study showed that microplastics are literally raining and snowing down on us, out of the sky, said the chief investigator of this study. Um, oh, and there, June 23rd, 2022, University of Montana. So what is it doing in the lake? Well, people are worried about lake populations, including trout. Trout fishing is a, a really, really awesome sport, actually. Isaac can tell you all about it. Um, but uh, I took a look around to see what kinds of studies are being done on the Montana wildlife, and I found Yellowstone trout are fairly threatened. And when a study a couple years ago took a look at Yellowstone cutthroat trout, they found that 30% of the ones they examined had microplastics in their stomachs, which is consistent with ruminants on land, and it's also consistent with what you get from fish. So it seems like there's a baseline background of microplastic across the planet that's impacting things in a very similar way. And there is lake. So with all of this microplastic floating around, how is that gonna impact us? Well, we know because it's in the air that we're breathing it and it's in the water, so we're drinking it. And much like the, uh, the, the um, location studies, when we look at our food, we find it most places that we're looking also. So it's been found in beer, bottled water that's coming in a plastic bottle, absolutely guaranteed to have a higher load of microplastics than anything you're gonna get from the tap. Seafood, sugar, salt, honey, pretty much everything is gonna have some, some level of microplastics in it at this point. Ultimately, we find that we ingest about five grams of plastic a week, which is the equivalent of a credit card, which raises a lot of questions. This is really bringing it home for people. The big question, of course, is, well, what's happening to me when I eat all that plastic? The good news is that you do pass most of it. 90% or more goes right through you. But that still leaves a percentage of plastic in your body that you probably don't want to have in your body and we would really like to know what it's doing when it gets there. Well, we've started to find various different spots in the body where it's popping up. Um, some of the studies have shown it in the human lung, probably from breathing, um, in the intestine, probably from eating, uh, but it's also popped up on both sides of the placenta, mother and child. Uh, it's in meconium, which is the first stool that an infant passes, so before a newborn child has eaten anything they have microplastics in their stool. It's in human breast milk, um, and it was recently located in the human bloodstream, which causes people to ask, well, what about the blood-brain barrier then? If it's in the blood, when is it gonna cross into the brain? Can it do that? We don't have evidence yet in humans that it's in the brain, but we do have animal studies that show that it, yes, in mice and in zebrafish, we can see that it has crossed and it does impact their behavior. So we're looking. So this is really getting upsetting. So these are my daughter's rabbits, Lassie and Noelle. They are super adorable. If you need an adorable rabbit, get a mini lock. They're like this big, they're like jelly beans. They're so cute. So just take a breath. <laughs> we'll continue. Uh, I'll try to do so with at least a little bit of levity. What does it mean? Um, so investigators are looking. And as you mentioned, I had the privilege of being on one of the teams that was looking really hard. Um, this is a tiny fraction of that team, but the chief investigator here was Philip Landrigan, who is a person who is a pedi pe pediatrist, I'm gonna talking all day, pediatrician and a toxicologist. And he spent his career looking at pesticides, lead, other similar um, toxicants on children and on developing fetuses. And of course, every time the findings are horrendous, but what he's really good at is leveraging those findings. It's not enough to have the data. You have to take the data to the policymakers and demonstrate that it's got an impact. You've got to take it to the public. You've got to let people know. And he's been enormously effective in his career in doing that. He was one of the people who was instrumental in getting lead out of gasoline on the basis of its impact on developing children. So he's taking aim now at plastics because he's seeing the same thing. Uh, he was noting that, you know, if you go through the toxicological profile of plastics, which I'll get to in short order, they tick every box for a, uh, a bannable substance, a hazardous substance that could and should be banned through the Stockholm Convention, which is an international instrument that we use. Um, so this was a group that had a lot of scary data and a lot of hope, because Phil's done it before, and he continually keeps pointing to the Montreal Protocol, which banned CFCs, fluorofluorocarbons, uh, and helped keep us from 
destroying the ozone layer. It took the entire planet's consensus to do that, and we did it. So if we can do that, we can do this. So what happens to the human body when it encounters plastics? Well, the first one is mechanical, which is punctures. And the place that we can think about that uh, is the digestive tract. We know, for instance, that patients that have irritable bowel syndrome seem to have a higher load of microplastics in their bowel tissue. But we don't know which side the horse and the cart are on. Is it because the tissue was inflamed by the plastic, or does inflamed tissue take up plastic? Not sure. But we do know that when you put plastic next to human tissue, it does get inflamed. The next thing is the makeup of the plastic itself. So plastics are made of chemicals and fossil fuels. Uh, fossil fuels mostly being, in this case, um, oil and gas, especially ethane gas. The chemicals, though, are what we want to think about the most. Um, the chemicals are added for lots of reasons. To turn a, a you know, pint of oil into a plastic fork, fork, you're going to need plasticizers, coatings, heat stabilizers, antioxidants, UV stabilizers, flame retardants. There are more than 10,500 chemicals that are used in the production of plastic that we know of. We actually know that there are thousands and thousands more, but they're trade secrets. They're proprietary. And the way that the law works with chemicals, many chemicals, they're innocent until proven guilty. So I can innovate a chemical tomorrow, if I could innovate a chemical, and put it out there on the market, and then just wait to see if it kills anybody. And it will take about 30 years of data to get that, that to be proven definitively enough that the FDA or the EPA might get involved. Um, so we get a lot, of, a lot of chemicals out there. 2,300 of them that have been studied are chemicals of concern, meaning that they're known carcinogens, they're neurotoxicants, and their endocrine disruptors. So we know that those impact human health. So this is Phil's slide, and I find it pretty instructive. What is plastic? This is the only chemistry slide I hope to show you. Um, so the polymer back backbone is that carbon-carbon bond that makes plastic so strong, and that's these guys. But then you've got all these additives, and they're phthalates, these phenols, PFAS, brominated flame retardants. You've probably heard of these. They sort of float around in the like scary do not eat category. They just sit inside the cell, or rather inside the molecule. Now, the molecular bonds aren't going to break, but these guys don't have any bonds at all. So they can drop out of the cell and they cell, geez, uh, out of the molecule anytime. And they do. For the entire existence of this molecule, it will continually leach out chemicals. Um, among the ways that you can look at it doing are, you know, if you have foodstuffs that are sitting in plastic, you've got the bottle, which is largely chemical, you've got the foodstuff, and then you've got whatever's going on outside, and the bottle is going to leach out into the food and into the outside. Ways that it will leach more, high temperatures. So no matter what you read on a microwavable anything, if it's plastic and it says microwave safe, do not do it. If you take anything home from this presentation, don't nuke it in plastic or heated in plastic. Portion size matters. The smaller portion sizes, you have more a greater ratio of exposure from the food to the plastic. Long contact hours, so if it's been sitting on your shelf for years, kind of looks like a good idea, might not be a good idea. And fat-soluble foods will also take in a lot more of these chemicals. What are they? Well, flame retardants. This one, I hadn't thought about very much until I started working with Beyond Plastics and thought, oh yeah, fossil fuel, Legos. I don't want my Legos spontaneously combusting lots of flame retardants. And you'll find flame retardants especially in synthetic carpets, in our clothing, in furniture, a lot of that. Um, these phenols and phthalates, you find a lot of these, and these are endocrine disruptors, uh, in a lot of very common objects. So plastics that are rigid, baby bottles are a good example, will have a lot of these phenols in them. Plastics that are soft, that are malleable, will have a lot of phthalates. Endocrine disruptors um, are pretty insidious. What they do is they mimic hormones. They look a lot like a hormone. The hormones, of course, travel around the human body flipping switches, telling your body what to do and when. So they're, they're basically on-off switches, and they're very, very carefully synchronized. Um, let's see. When they're disrupted, they affect necessary systems all over the body. So endocrine disruptors can impact hormones that regulate our appetite and our metabolism causing obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. 
Endocrine disruptors can disrupt brain development, causing lower IQ, ADHD, and autism spectrum disorders. And endocrine disruptors can cause cancers, especially breast, prostate, and testicular cancers. And all of those things are on the uptick. Periods of greatest vulnerability to endocrine disruptors are developing fetuses, for whom it's a very significant issue for the um, intellectual development. Um, small babies, infants, crawling kids, and toddlers. Um, and one thing that all of these groups have in common is that none of them can vote. So here's the bunny skin. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna get better from here. Because from here, we're gonna start thinking about solutions. Oh, I'm sorry. Other ways that plastics can kill you, things that go kablooey because this is a highly industrial thing, so if you, you've got extraction and then you've got production, you've got a lot of things that go kablooey. Here's one of the most recent ones, which, you know, with heavy industry chemical transport, you've probably heard a lot about the East Palestine train derailment, which had train cars of polyvinyl chloride that were destined for plastics. Turns out the EPA never ruled on, on lighting those cars on fire. It was a decision by, I believe, the transit authority to keep the rails clear for industry. So they lit, it on, lit them on fire because that was the fastest way to get rid of them. Uh, oh, plastic and uh, climate change. Yeah, okay, fossil carbon, climate change, class dismissed. Like, really? <laughs> you've got a thing that's made out of a fossil carbon, it's gonna be off-gassing all through its life cycle, and it does. And it does it to the extent, not just the off-gassing, but the energy necessary to create plastics. That if plastic were a country, it would be the fifth largest uh, climate pollutant. So huge link right there. So why is this happening? Here we are with the solutions. There are answers, and with these answers, we can solve the problem. And I'm about to go over time, so I'm about to start talking faster. Uh, <laughs> why is it happening now? Well, the good news and the bad news, and then some more bad news and some good news also, is the climate crisis. People who are sane are looking for renewable energies and are purchasing renewable energies. Renewable energy is now beginning to outstrip fossil fuels by price. It's becoming cheaper. It is a miracle how quickly our renewable energy sources have been tapped and scaled. Um, but that is starting to make the fossil fuel industry very nervous where they're not going to be able to sell fossil fuels, they're looking for other markets, other things that you can make out of oil and gas. And that is plastic. So plastic is the plan B of the fossil fuel industry, of the petrochemical industry. They've been at this for quite some time, and that is why around 2005, we started seeing an uptick in production of plastic, because they were opening new markets at the same rate that they did, or in the same way that they did at the end of World War II. And as a part of that, they're building out production. So in order to make a gas into a plastic, you take ethane, which is a gas that you especially get from fracking, superheat it and crack the molecule, uh, and then you've got ethylene. And now you can make polyethylene tetrahydrate, PET, and a lot of other plastics, mostly the kinds of plastics that we use for packaging, the cheap ones. So they're building out. They want to triple production by 2050. They want to make more petrochemical facilities and they're investing huge amounts of money in doing that. This is what an FA cracker plant looks like. This is a new one in Pennsylvania. It costs $6 billion to create it. What it turns out is these guys, these little myrtles. A thousand of these will make you a plastic water bottle that's disposable, like a single-use plastic water bottle. And the build-out is strategic. Some of it, of course, is happening where there are resources. So for instance, up here, Kentucky, Ohio, and Pennsylvania is the Marcellus Shale, which is fracking area. And down here in Texas and Louisiana, we've got lots and lots of petrochemical stuff. But a lot of what's happening here is about political cleft also. Because New York State is sitting right on top of the Marcellus Shale also, but New York State had the political clout to ban fracking. So the industry is placing their new pipelines and their new um, manufacturing areas in places where people are predominantly poor, where they're people of color, where they don't have the clout to fight back, which makes this absolutely uh, a, uh, an environmental justice issue. Living on the fence line is no fun. <laughs> on one hand, you're looking at a lot of uh, petrochemical plants, but you're also being directly exposed to all of these chemicals and all of this industry that the rest of us experience only second, third, and fourth hand. 
So industry is going to fight tooth and nail to keep those plants open once they're constructed because they do not want to deal with what's called stranded asset. If you put $6 billion into an ethane cracker plant, you're going to make sure that you can keep on doing this every day, all day, for as long as possible. And the people nearby are looking at this. So how do we solve this? <laughs> Very solvable. <laughs> Go back to the cat. She's only 15 years old. <laughs> to stop plastic pollution, we have to stop making plastic. And by plastic, frankly, I mean what Phil Landrigan calls the stupid plastics, the single-use plastic, the low-hanging fruit, the plastic that we didn't need in 2000 or 1988 or even necessarily 1970 because there's an awful lot of that. And that is the stuff that's floating around everywhere. I haven't seen any IV bags festooned from trees, and it would be very unusual to find, well, I guess you could find like a car bumper floating around in the ocean, but that's not most of what we're encountering. We're encountering the little stuff. The little stuff, people want to get rid of. The, uh, the opinion polls are very consistent on this. Globally, about 80% of people polled want regulatory change to stop that kind of plastic pollution. They want limits on single-use plastics. And those limits are easy to obtain, at least when there's not a ban on fans, which is what Isaac and Mike are going to talk about. Uh, at Beyond Plastics, we find change happens locally and spins up. So when Missoula bans plastic bags, then Bozeman bans them, and so does Helena, and then so does Hamilton. And then you've got a lot of state, and then you wind up with a statewide ban, which joins the other statewide bans, like New Jersey, California, New York. And that makes it possible on the federal level, because now you have a, a huge amount of evidence that this is a good thing, that consumers like it, and that nobody's living in the Stone Age. The low-hanging fruit are plastic bags, polystyrene, which, by the way, styrene is hugely carcinogenic. That should be the first thing to go. Um, plastic straws, splash guards, intentional release of balloons. Uh, and these are all you know, kind of uh, alternatives. So for instance, Deliver Zero is a food organization. They're in Colorado now. They, uh, they give um, reusable materials to restaurants. And then the restaurants send out their, um, their delivery with that. And then their delivery people or whoever ordered the food bring it back, it gets washed, it gets reused. HB 407. I'm going to pretty much leave this to uh, Mike and Isaac in the tiny amount of time that I seem to be leaving them also, because they are on top of it. And there is so much to do, but there's also an awful lot of hope. Um, they're going to talk to you about part of the approach here is constitutional, because you guys in Montana have a right to a clean environment. And the children, the children who sued um, in Hell versus the state of Montana were cognizant of it. So if they can do it, we can do it. Uh, Beyond Plastics has also rolled out a local groups and affiliates program, which Yupa and uh, Families for a Livable Climate are an affiliate. Uh, and then there's Gallup Valley Beyond Plastics, which is a local. It gives people like everybody in this room an opportunity to volunteer and to be effective in your volunteering. Um, so yes, we skipped the straw, but we'll also teach you more advocacy measures, how to really get in there and talk to who needs to be talked to, how to push the buttons and flip the levers in our democratic system. So I'll encourage you to sign up. If you've got your phone, you can uh, take a picture of the QR code. Um, you'll get monthly e-newsletters e and that sort of thing. Um, and join the fight, because the fight is on, and it's a good one. So thank you so much for your attention. Sorry for your Um, to give us an overview of plastic policies in Montana. Um, they, well, they are here from the Cotton Blue Environmental Law Center in Bozeman. Um, and they were on the forefront of helping organize um, to, to protest um, HB 407. And they were, they, um, and Yupa has been working really closely with them. I don't know a little bit later. Um, Isaac 
is a grassroots um, conservation coordinator for the environmental, the Cottonwood Environmental Law Center. Went to the University of Utah and received his degree in political science and environmental studies. And he was attracted to come to Cottonwood um, to because he was so dissatisfied with what, what the status quo. Um, and at Cottonwood, he wears a number of hats. He is a researcher, a communication specialist, an organizer, and as he labels himself, a lackluster IT guy. <laughs> and he um, spends a lot of time in the outdoors in his free time. And Mike Billy is an advisory board member for Cottonwood, and he received his law degree from the University of Montana, so yeah, welcome back. Um, shortly thereafter, he went to Bozeman and worked um, in the Attorney General of the Gallatin County Attorney's Office before he um, decided to um, open his own private practice. So um, I would ask you to welcome them. They're going to inform us on uh, the state of uh, environmental policy. Classic. Yes. Yep. All right. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah. I'll talk loud. Okay. All right. Thank you, Liz. Um, thank you, you, Yuba, families for a livable climate, and thank you, Vegan. Um, so, Vegan gave us a really good overview of the plastics issue. And I think that everyone in this room probably agrees that we have to do something about it. This is really important, it's pressing, um, and our health really depends on it. So now I'm gonna take that, that bigger picture um, idea and zoom it in a little bit on Montana and talk a little bit about what we at Cotton Environmental Law Center and some of our partners have been doing over the last year um, and what we intend on doing for the next year or two to try and figure out this issue, and try to navigate some of the legal difficulties that we've been blessed with by the Montana legislature. <laughs> um, but before that, uh, like Liz said, my name is Isaac Cheek. I'm the Grassroots Conservation Coordinator at Cottonwood Environmental Law Center. Um, Cottonwood is a small 501c3 nonprofit law firm based out of Bozeman. Um, our mission is to protect the people, forests, water, and wildlife of the American West. Um, and we feel like by working on this plastics issue, we are doing that. Um, all right. Oh, before I get into the meat of the issue, I do want to acknowledge, you've already did this um, very nicely, but I want to acknowledge some of our partners. Um, this is, the effort over the last year has not been just a cottonwood thing. Um, we were approached by Gallatin Valley Beyond Plastics initially last summer, which is a chapter of Beyond Plastics in Bozeman, um, to come to one of their events and to meet Vegan and meet Yuba, kind of, um, so that we could all be on the same page about how do we overcome this issue that is HB407, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and from there, we kind of decided that we needed to reach out to groups across the state and build up a grassroots network um, of different groups and individuals who are concerned about this issue. And as soon as we started doing that, we realized how many people across the state really are concerned about this. So from Billings, um, Sustainable Billings, Katie Harris who runs an awesome group over there. She was instrumental in getting Billings on board with this at the legislature. Matt is here from MEIC who helped us out in the legislature as well. Um, and uh, Families for Livable Climate. Uh, throughout the presentation, I'll be referring to partners quite often. And I just want to put it out there that that's referring to the list of people that was talking about. So let's get into the meat of the issue, which is, oh, there might be some weird formatting. I just switched it to PowerPoint from the keynote, so I apologize if things get cut off. But um, so really what we're facing is one big roadblock in Montana that we need to overcome if we want to do anything about the plastic <coughs> issue locally. And that roadblock is Hospital 407. And I want to start with that, start with the bad news, because from here on out, this whole presentation is going to be solutions oriented because there's plenty of solutions. Um, House Bill 407 
was passed by the legislature in 2021. Um, and it's been since dubbed a ban on bans. And the official title was Statewide Uniformity in Auxiliary Container Regulations. Basically what it did is it made it so that local governments and citizens can't pass um, any ordinances, resolutions, or citizen um, initiatives to regulate plastics at all. So it kind of tied everyone's hands behind their backs. Um, and it was done under this guise that you're gonna have uniform regulations statewide. No regulations exist statewide on plastics. But either way, this is what we're stuck with right now. We need to figure out how do we overcome and circumvent how or circumvent House Bill 407 so that we can address the plastics issue on a local level and have that invariably spread to a more than local level, a statewide level and a national level. But first we have to figure out House Bill 407. So that's what we tried to do this legislative session. And we tried to do that in a few ways. Um, our first strategy was pretty simple. We, um, we tried to combine local pressure with um, some state action to repeal House Bill 407 outright. Um, and it went okay, especially at the beginning. Um, we got some cities on board, um, Bozeman and Missoula both passed resolutions that basically told the legislature, hey, you either need to pass the law and have an actual statewide uniform plastics regulation, or you need to give us the power back to address this issue. And, and those resolutions were passed in Missoula and Bozeman. Um, the city of Billings unanimously supported the eventual legislation, which I'll get to. Um, so with the local pressure from cities, plus local pressure from citizen groups, um, including like, groups like Sustainable Billings and Families for Local Climate, and Galaxy on Plastics, um, as well as a bunch of individuals across the state who were really concerned about this issue. We had a pretty solid group of people who went to the legislature and told them, hey, you need to give the power back to local governments. Um, and they did that when they testified in favor of House Bill 413, which was proposed by Representative Ed Staffan out of Bozeman. House Bill 413 was the state action that we were encouraging. Um, it was very, very simple. It just took the language that was added to the Montana Code annotated by HB 407 and took it out. So it would have given the power back to local governments to address this issue um, and back to citizens to pass local initiatives to address this issue. It would not have forced local governments to pass plastics ordinances and it wouldn't have taken the power away from the state to pass statewide regulations. Um, so we thought it was pretty reasonable because over the last year, um, the state had said we're passing HB 407 in order to have statewide uniformity. They had not passed any bills to create the statewide uniform regulation. So we figured that hey, it's time to give the power back to the local governments. Unfortunately, um, House Bill 413 was voted down along party lines um, in the uh, House Local Government. Um, and that was a bummer, but it wasn't, it wasn't all bad because this House Bill 413 was beneficial for two reasons. One, um, it helped set the groundwork for future legislation. So if we decide the next <coughs> legislative session that we want to bring a similar bill that would repeal House Bill 407, we have that text written. Um, we have multiple representatives who are very much on our team. Um, and more importantly, the second reason it was beneficial is because when we went to the legislature and brought this bill, and we had the day where everyone went to the Capitol and testified in favor of it, we had people show up that we didn't know were on our side. Um, so it, it grew the group of people in Montana and interconnected people um, who were in favor of repealing House Bill 407 and taking action on plastic. Um, but we don't really want to wait. We didn't want to wait until the next legislative session. We want to do something about plastics right now. So. Our second option was to um, push for HB 638, um, which would have been a statewide regulation on plastics. HB 638 was um, brought by Marilyn Marler out of Missoula, and it, this was the third year in a row that it had been brought, um, and it would gradually phase out styrofoam, polystyrene, like Megan said, across the state. Um, and it was a slow phase out. Um, this bill's been workshopped for a few years. But again, it died in today. Um, so now what? We 
we've tried to uh, pass the statewide regulation to satisfy HB 407, um, and we tried to get rid of HB 407 to give the power back to local governments. So we kind of gave the legislature two ways out of this frankly bad bill, um, and they didn't take them. So what are we going to do now? Uh, that's what Mike is going to talk about. Um, we're exploring some litigation options. We're at Environmental Law Center, so that is um, kind of where we're thinking of going with that, and Mike will give more details on that. Um, but before we get to the potential litigation to address HB 407, um, I wanted to give some action items that you can do to support the groups that are um, fighting to get rid of HB 407 so that we can do something about classics in Montana. Um, so one thing you can do, if you're interested, after Mike talks about what this litigation might look like, if you're interested in getting involved, whether that be as a plaintiff or if you're part of a group that might be interested in getting involved as a plaintiff, um, please reach out to us. And I'll leave the contact info for Cottonwood um, up when Mike is speaking. Um, and uh, second, if you just want to stay in the loop, um, and we'll send out action alerts as things come up, although there's not quite as many, you won't get quite as many action alerts about the litigation as you would legislation because the citizens wouldn't be involved in that as much. But um, if you want to just kind of stay up to date, figure out what's going on, and, and hear about when we potentially file this lawsuit, then uh, you can go on our website, cottonwoodlaw.org, uh, scroll to the very bottom, and sign up for our newsletter, and you'll hear more about some of our other work as well. Um, and the last thing that would be really helpful is if you could make a donation to Cottonwood Law or um, help fundraise on behalf of Cottonwood Law, because we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we represent all of our clients pro bono, so to um, move forward with the litigation that Mike's going to talk about, we rely on um, funds from individual donors. Um, and if you scan that barcode, that'll take you to our donation page, and from there you can navigate and look at some of our other work um, on things like clean water as well. Um, this is how you can get a hold of us. Uh, and again, you can scan the barcode to get to our website. Um, Thank you all, thank you all for coming out tonight, and I'll go ahead and pass the mic over to Mike. Thank you and good evening. I had to chuckle when I saw the screen come up and describe me as a long time Bozeman attorney. That's just a nice way of saying I'm old. <laughs> but it's true. I graduated from the University of Montana Law School in 1978. And every time I come into the valley through the Elgate Canyon, uh, I have a lot of fond memories of my time here in Missoula. I'm always glad to come back. I'm really pleased to be here tonight. This last year, I have served as an advisor for uh, Cottonwood Law. And we have been strategizing a way to tackle this problem of single-use plastic. And we have taken a couple of steps so far, um, and now we're ready to take the next. And that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. I have recommended to Continent Law to file a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of House Bill 407. We think that there are three grounds on which that statute unconstitutional. The first uh, round is to do with its title. Um, Isaac put the title to that bill up on the screen for you and generally said it was a law revising uh, laws to assure uniformity and statewide regulation of auxiliary containers. Well, think about that for a second. Revising existing laws concerning auxiliary containers, there are no laws uh, regulating single use plastic. So it's very deceptive. Second, it talks about auxiliary containers. How many of you know what the auxiliary container is? You have to look at the definition you statute to know. A straw is an auxiliary container. A spoon plastic spoon is an auxiliary container. Those, in my mind, are not containers. They're certainly not auxiliary. 
Well, under our Constitution, we have a provision that provides that the title to a bill has to fulfill two requirements. First, it has to address a single topic. Second, it has to state its topic in clear, understandable terms. Well, I don't think auxiliary containers is a clear, understandable term. I think it's a deceptive term. Nobody reading that title would know that it's referring to single-use plastics. Second, there is no law out there to be revised. So it's deceptive in its suggestion that it is revising the existing law. So for those two reasons, I think that bill violates our constitutional right to a title that plainly, clearly describes its topic. That's number one. Number two, we have a constitutional right to petition as local electors in a... Thank you. Thank you. This is a very specific... We have a constitutional right to petition our statewide government to change things. But we also have a constitutional right to petition our local government. We have an initiative or a referendum. HB 407 specifically prohibits us from doing that. That, to me, is a clear violation of our constitutional right. Our constitutional right to petition is unequivocal, unqualified, unconditional. So that's the second reason that I think that statute is unconstitutional. The third reason is a little more complicated. You can put up a reference to Hill v. State of Montana. I'm sure you're all familiar with that case. We hear all the time about our constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment. That's only part of the equation. There is a duty, a constitutional duty, that's imposed upon everyone. Individuals, corporations, cities and towns. I believe that that constitutional duty is imposed upon Bozeman, it's imposed upon Missoula, it's imposed upon Helena, it's imposed upon every city to maintain and improve a clean, healthful environment. HB 407 prevents cities and towns from fulfilling their constitutional obligation. At the same time that it's denying us, the citizens of Montana, our right to a clean and healthful environment. So it's a two-pronged analysis. One, we have the right to a clean and healthful environment. Two, cities and towns have a constitutional duty to maintain and improve a clean and healthful environment. HB 407 prevents cities and towns from fulfilling that obligation, that duty. At the same time, the Constitution imposes a mandatory duty upon the legislature to provide adequate remedies to assure that we have a clean and healthful environment. Our legislature has done nothing to regulate single-use plastics. Nothing. That, in my mind, is a breach of its duty to do so. So, on one hand, we have the legislature failing to fulfill its constitutional duty. At the same time, it's preventing cities and towns across the state from fulfilling its and their constitutional duty. That, to me, makes 407 unconstitutional. The thing is, we need to keep this in context. Before 1972, Montana Constitution provided that cities and towns only had the powers granted to them by the Constitution. In 1972, we adopted a new Constitution that completely flipped the switch. Now, under our Constitution, cities and towns have the right and the power to do all that they believe is necessary to take care of their citizens unless the legislature takes that power away from them. 
Constitution. That particular change in our Constitution was supported almost unanimously by the delegates to the Constitutional Convention. All of those delegates testified in favor of that provision, talked about how important it was for local citizens, grassroots folks, to control their government, to do what they thought was best for them. The legislature, since 1972, has consistently and routinely eroded that power. This statute is only one of many that the legislature has passed to deny cities and towns power to regulate environmental issues. The legislature not only bans cities from regulating single-use plastics, the legislature has banned cities and towns from adopting building codes that make buildings uh, electric, uh, uh, not efficient, um, electric grid. I think that's what you're it has banned cities and towns from regulating natural gas hookups to, to buildings. It has consistently taken steps to prevent cities and towns from addressing environmental concerns that concern all of us. Single-use plastics is the only one. So I think now is the time to stand up, for cities and towns to stand up. It's time for us to stand up. It's time for everyone to stand up to the legislature and tell them we have the right to control our destiny. We've taken it from us. We want the court now to step in and tell you you're depriving those folks, you're depriving those cities and towns of their rights to govern their affairs. You're depriving them of the right to protect their constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment. That's exactly what we intend to do with this lawsuit. We're hoping that you'll all join us in that effort. Those, those chemicals. Thank you. No problem. 
Other questions? Oh, we have a couple. Just something to add about the Nurdles. Um, there's a citizen science project called Nurdle Patrol. Uh, we've done it in a couple summer camps here in Missoula where you can get a free Nurdle kit and go look for Nurdles in waterways and along um, railroad tracks and stuff like that. It's really fun. It's free. If you have kids, you can go look for Nurdles. We haven't found any here in Missoula. Think right. this. Actually, the Nurdle Patrol started in Texas, and they won a big lawsuit against Formosa. And so there's there's uh, reasons to be collecting those things. This is Michelle from Home Resource, and they've done a lot of work on zero waste in Missoula. Um, thanks for such great information today. And um, the policy discussion is fascinating, and it is, it is a tough one. But good people are on this. I really appreciate that. But my question is, is there a good plate? So on one hand, policy is very important, but then there's also, from the bottom up, people changing their habits, and is there a good resource to go? And frankly, my specific question is, we have over 40,000 dogs in this valley on top of an aquifer, and they want people to pick up their dog waste. And now I'm starting to wonder, are my biodegradable dog baggies truly biodegradable? Like what what should we be doing? And maybe as on a broader level, is there are there some good websites to go regarding next best steps? I would look at as any zero waste website is gonna give you more of the stuff than I could ever start skewing. I mean there are many, many good resources for moving away from plastics in your consumer habits. Um, so yeah just Google zero waste and there's zero waste groups in many, many cities. Um, probably including, or almost definitely including this one. Um, the compostable bag question uh, is an unfortunate, like I'll get thrown out of the dinner party for, you know, bursting everyone's bubble on this. Um, bioplastics are still plastic. So bioplastics may be derived from carbon that comes from corn um, sugars or beet sugars, but all of the additives that go into plasticizing them are the same ones, so they're just as toxic. Oftentimes, things that are labeled bioplastic are only a percentage bioplastic, and the rest is conventional plastic. Compostable plastic may or may not be sourced from from vegetables and, and you know carbon that grows. But the idea with with compostable plastic is that it's going to break down. It almost universally doesn't as effectively as the manufacturers say. Um, the last statistic I had was that about 1% of industrial compost facilities would even take compostable plastics because it takes them so long to degrade that it just mucks up the whole works. Um, the one in my own um, county was taking them for a while, but people who were buying the compost were just finding plastic everywhere. Um, you know, when they put it in their gardens. And so they were running it through one, two, three times um, through that industrial process. Uh, compostable plastic will not compost in your backyard. It won't do it. It needs um, like long periods of applied heat. It just isn't going to break down. And it's not going to break down in a landfill any faster than anything else either. So a lot of like, you know, compostable dinnerware and stuff, it's great. It looks good but it's just gonna wind up in the trash with all the other trash. When it does compost, it composts along with all of the other additives. So now you've got hazardous waste compost. So organic um, farmers can't use compost that's created that has bioplastics or compostable plastics in it. And that's the, actually, that's the number one reason why a lot of the industrial composters won't take it, because it makes their product worthless. So that's a huge downer, but, <laughs> The answer is always, every time you can possibly do it, reusables or, you know, falling back on the older methods. So before we had doggy bags that were plastic, there were paper bags, there was newspaper. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's a little bit grosser, but it's so much better for the planet uh, that, you know, falling back onto those solutions is, is really the best thing for everyone. Someone did tell me there is a doggy duty or something like that, you dig a hole in it, you can put it in your yard and it can compost uh, dog waste that way. So there might be some industrial applications for that, I don't know. 
Um, just to point out, Jeremy Drake is here, and he does a lot of zero waste work in the schools, and is also connected with Zero Waste USA. So he's a great resource. Other questions? We have five more minutes. Okay, well, we'll have time to chat and connect with each other. And thank you so much. There is a handout that has 10 ways to reduce plastic pollution, and also including voting for people who, who uh, will support reducing plastic pollution. And Beyond Plastics, Families for a Little Climate Plastics Working Group, and Cottonwood, um, Websites are also there, lots of information, and we hope you join us. We're going to be working on these issues for a while. So thank you all for coming, and have a great night, and connect with each other. Okay, thanks. Bye.